also my great pleasure to introduce the president and CEO of the United States Capitol Historical Society, Jane Campbell, who will formally start today's program. Jane. Thank you, Sam. Um, and thank you always for the work you do to put these important uh, webinars together. We are grateful for your time, your energy, and your talent. Today, I want to welcome you to a very important uh, webinar. Think back. On Sunday, Washington, D.C. celebrated Emancipation Day, uh, when in 1862, slavery was finally purged from our nation's capital. This seismic event prompted a stunned Frederick, Doug Frederick Douglass to concede, I trust I'm not dreaming, but events taking place seem like a dream. Douglas then predicted that the first freed progress was not only a staggering blow to slavery throughout the country, but a killing blow to the rebellion and the beginning of the end for both. Three years later, he was proven correct. That is why the United States Capitol Historical Society continues our series on the Constitution with a study of the 13th Amendment, the battle for its passage, its impact and the legacy today. We will explore the economic impact of slavery, both as a Southern institution, but also as a driver of Northern manufacturing. Discuss Lincoln's views on the constitutionality of slavery, the legal basis for the Emancipation Proclamation, and why the 13th Amendment was still necessary. Finally, we will detail the immeasurable impact of the 13th Amendment on African Americans and our society. But why we continue to grapple with the history of slavery in a nation that was conceived in liberty and is still dedicated to the proposition that all are created equal. Our featured guest to lead this important conversation is distinguished professor, Dr. Thavolia Glimpf. Dr. Glimpf is the Peabody Family Distinguished Professor of History and Professor of Law at Duke University. Her most recent book, The Woman's Fight, The Civil War's Battle for Home, Freedom, and Nation, won several awards, including the 2021 Beverage Award from the American Historical Association as the best English language book on the history of the United States, Latin America, or Canada, from 1492 to the present. Her first book, Out of the House of Bondage, The Transformation of the Plantation Household, won the 2009 Philip Taft Labor History Book Award. Professor Glimpf is the past president of the Southern Historical Association, an elected member of the Society of American Historians, the American Antiquarian Society, the board of directors of the Gettysburg Foundation, and the president-elect of the American Historical Association. This is but a small set sample of her accomplishments. And so today we turn the podium over to our distinguished speaker, Professor Glimpf. Welcome, the podium is yours. And we remind people that if you think of questions, put them in the q and I will handle them at the conclusion of Professor Glimp's per presentation. Take it away. Good afternoon. Um, first, uh, my thanks to uh, Jane Campbell um, and to Sam Holliday and the rest of the staff at the US Capitol uh, Hill Society for inviting me and um, patiently working with me as we had to reschedule as I'm honored to be with you today, and I want to start our conversation, um, I'm going to talk for maybe about 25, 30 minutes uh, <clears throat> to leave um, time for a q and A. I want to start with a well-known um, among historians and among many people who are not historians, a well-known letter from a Black soldier during the Civil War, a letter he wrote to his daughters and to the woman who claimed ownership of him. This is the famous Spotswood Rice letter, written in 1864. My children, I take my pen in hand to write you a few lines to let you know 
that I have not forgot you and that I want to see you as bad as ever. Now, my dear children, I want you to be content and be assured that I will have you if it cost me my life. On the 28th of the month, 800 white and black soldiers expects to start up the river to Glasgow. And we expect to be generaled by a general that will give both of you, his children, to him. Don't be uneasy, he said to them. I expect to have you. If Diggs, the slaveholder, don't give up, this government will. And I am confident I will get you. She said, I tried to steal you. But God never intended for man to steal his own flesh and blood. If I had no confidence in God, I could have confidence in her. So this letter by a black soldier is one of hundreds of letters written by enslaved people and freed people during the Civil War, expressing their desire, one, to be free, and also their confidence that the federal government and the Union Army would stand by them in helping them to get their freedom. But when the war began in 1861, slavery retained a very powerful place in our history, in our economy, in our political and social life. In 1861, very few Americans even thought that abolition would be an outcome of the war. This is no less true for white Northerners than white Southerners. Slave emancipation was, re was a result far from the world white people had set out in 1861, either to defend for slavery or to end, at least to end the expansion of slavery. The freedom of black people was not on the Northern agenda, when it fired back in 1861 on Fort Sumter, but rather, as historians have made clear, freedom became a policy aim of the U.S. government during the war, and Black people, enslaved people, played a major role in turning the tide by refusing to abide the government's insistence that the war had nothing to do with them, that its objectives had nothing to do with freedom. Emancipation was a protracted process, though still widely viewed and often misunderstood as something that happened in 1865 with the ratification of the 13th Amendment in December of that year, preceded, of course, by the partial, uh, em uh, partial emancipation decree that Lincoln issued in 1863. Eight years ago, we marked the 150th anniversary of the ratification of the 13th Amendment, uh, the beginning of a five-year period of constitutional transformation that included the 14th and the 15th Amendments. Many Americans at the time and still today saw these amendments and the Civil Rights Act that came in 1866 as ushering in what Lincoln would call a new birth of freedom. And scholars like Eric Foner have referred to as the nation's second founding. Enslaved people rejected the war platforms advanced by the Union and by the Confederacy in 1861, both of which called for slavery's continuance. In passing the 13th Amendment to abolish slavery, Congress responded not only to an activist and significant abolitionist movement in the North, but also to the pressure of longstanding abolitionists in the South, enslaved people. It is worth remembering that on March 16, 1861, a month before the war began and two days before Lincoln was sworn in, both houses of Congress passed a joint resolution to amend the Constitution of the United States. 
this resolution passed <clears throat> by Congress in March of 1861 was designed to, to ensure or assure um, the Southern states that were contemplating or had already uh, announced um, secession that the United States, the federal government, the North had no intention of ending slavery, that that was not the Republican platform nor Lincoln's objective. So they wanted to basically assure Southerners that the area here marked in green or colored in green, it was okay if that area remained um, uh, um, an area dedicated to slavery. The joint resolution that they passed, um, known as Joint Resolution 1861, also known as the Corwin Amendment, stated explicitly that no amendment shall be made to the Constitution which will authorize or give to Congress the power to abolish or interfere within any state with the domestic institutions thereof, including that of persons held to labor or service. So in 1861, in March, mid-March, basically Congress said, we want and do pass an amendment to the Constitution that would become the 13th Amendment to the Constitution had not the war intervened, um, basically saying that we will not, we will not abolish slavery, we will not interfere. So one, you know, as I tell my students, just consider this, that Congress was willing to, in order to avert war, in order to keep the union together, to disavow by constitutional amendment, any effort to abolish slavery. This amendment, a proposed amendment, came about because President Buchanan, James Buchanan, had asked Congress to propose what he called an explanatory amendment with regard to slavery. In the House of Representatives, Thomas Corwin was elected or selected as the chair of this 33 member committee and William Seward as chair in the Senate or as the person who would take the lead in sponsoring the amendment. President Lincoln or, or, uh, was, um, a president elect Lincoln, I should say, was clear and adamant that there would be no compromises with regard to the extension of slavery, but we could compromise about slavery itself. The proposed amendment did not use the word slavery. It referred to slavery as a domestic institution. It did not use the word slave. It referred to enslaved people as person held, persons held to labor or service. Lincoln would send a letter or a letter to governors in the Northern states basically stating that he had no objection to this amendment. The amendment passed the House and the Senate, and it was sent to the states, but the war intervened. So the 13th Amendment would have been an amendment to protect slavery rather than what it became an amendment to abolish slavery. In his first inaugural address, President Lincoln voiced his approval of the amendment writing, I have no objection to its being made express and irrevocable. irrevocable. By supporting the amendment, he hoped to convince the South that he would not move or take any steps to abolish slavery. And at the minimum, keep the border states of Maryland and still then Virginia, which had not yet seceded, or Tennessee, Kentucky, and North Carolina from seceding. But events would get ahead of the president, events would get ahead of the nation, of the North, of the army itself. Lincoln was really concerned that if the North lost the support of the border states, in particular, the slaveholding border states of Maryland, Delaware, Kentucky, and Missouri, that there would be no way for the North to win the war. He wrote in a letter, I think, to lose Kentucky, 
is nearly the same as to lose the whole game. Lincoln was concerned at this point about a proclamation that had been issued by one of his generals in Missouri, General Fremont, who had issued a proclamation stating that um, the slaves of people who were um, in rebellion against the federal government would be emancipated. And Lincoln said, this proclamation cannot stand. It is purely political, and those were his exact words, purely political, and quote, not within the range of military law or necessity. And he, he, he made a very important comparison. He said, if a commanding general found it necessary to take a farm belonging to an enemy, to take a pasture, um, to use for an encampment or a fortification, that general had the right to do so. And he could hold it as long as necessary. That was within military law, but he said, once the war was over, or once the necessity of holding that property or taking that property ended, the farm had to go back to the owner and, its heir, and his or her heirs forever. The farm, when the farm is no longer needed for military purposes, it has to go back. And he said the same is true of slaves. You can take them, but you cannot emancipate them. You cannot um, say that they are forever free because we're talking about a matter of property here. And he said he was concerned in this letter because of the border states. I think to lose Kentucky is nearly the same as to lose the border states. And he said that he had received a telegraph on the news of General Fremont having actually issued deeds of manumission. And upon uh, Fremont issuing these deeds of manumission, he said he had heard, Lincoln said, he had heard that a whole company of volunteers threw, threw down their arms and disbanded. So again, you know, he, he said, we cannot afford, Lincoln basically was saying, to lose the border states, nor can we afford to lose um, soldiers who didn't go to war or join the army for um, uh, to end emancipation. I mean, to end slavery, I'm sorry. Enslaved people had a different opinion. It was their opinion that counted when Lincoln issued the partial emancipation decree of 1863 that all persons held as slaves or designated so, uh, in, in the state um, shall be thenceforth and forever free. Enslaved people <clears throat> had already decided that the position of the federal government was not a position that made any sense or was viable in a war and in particular in this civil war. So they became agents of their own emancipation. And in fact, Lincoln in the preliminary emancipation proclamation recognized their um, initiative and also recognized that um, uh, to, to really bring about wartime emancipation, they would have to, enslaved people would have to take an active role. And so he had encouraged them to make their own freedom. The passage of the Emancipation Proclamation, the continued movement of enslaved people from plantations and farms and other places to union lines or places that they thought would be places of safety or refuge, was joined uh, in, in May of 1863 by General Order Number 143. General Order 143 created the U.S. Colored Troops. And of course, as many of you know, by the war's end, roughly 180,000 or 179,000, 10% of the Union Army, um, Black men had served as soldiers, an additional 19,000 in the Navy. But to get there, to get to 
General Order 143, and eventually to get to the um, 13th Amendment, we have to start here with the determination of enslaved people to take their freedom. And of course, there are many such images as this one. Um, in this case, it's uh, one of the um, rarer images where you see uh, enslaved people being assisted by um, US soldiers. Oops. U.S. soldiers um, and officers increasingly wrote um, in their formal uh, uh, military communications about how the war was changing, such as this letter from General or Colonel T.W. Hickinson um, in the Low Country of South Carolina, Georgia, and, and Florida. Um, he said, I was interested to observe that the news of the president's proclamation produced a market effect. And in one case was of greatest service to us in securing the hearty aid of a guide who was timid and distrustful until he heard that he was legally free after which he aided us gladly and came away with us. And so, you know, uh, Hickinson was one of many um, union officers who increasingly talked about bringing away enslaved people. So you had two things going on. One, enslaved people running away on their own accord and two, union soldiers assisting them. Another image of uh, enslaved people trying to get to freedom this time um, by hopefully uh, uh, gaining access to union gunboats. <clears throat> Increasingly, the federal government <clears throat> is recognizing um, uh, these initiatives that Black people are taking, and, and Congress is passing measures to basically support them. Um, as Stanton um, uh, noted in a letter to General Saxton in 1862, um, that <clears throat> Black men and boys who are received into the service of the United States, who may have been slaves of rebel masters, or with their wives, children, and mothers declared forever free. So this is a, uh, he's referring to a measures passed by Congress in July of 1862. But again, when I, I began by saying this is a very protracted process, because even though um, these uh, congressional measures did this kind of work, it did not mean anything on the ground unless you could secure your freedom, which many enslaved people did, not only black men who joined the army, but black women and children who also joined the army by, you know, seeking um, a work as a cooks and laundresses and aides to officers um, as this uh, image captures. And here was another one with a black woman who secured work as a cook with a union um, uh, 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 company or regiment. And here, um, those who ran and could not find a place within the Union Army or armies um, as um, workers, whether um, uh, um, as cooks or nurses um, or laundresses, um, ended up, many ended up, thousands ended up in uh, these refugee camps like this one um, pictured here. This is an image of black hospital workers and during the war in Nashville, Tennessee. And of course, one of the some 179,000 black men who served in the US Army. We have, you know, um, these really wonderful images also from the war of Black soldiers and their families, and of Black women from the war. Um, this one um, with the, uh, a, a woman who has pinned the flag of the US to her chest. <clears throat> 
The 13th Amendment, I should go back, sorry. The 13th Amendment, as many of you know, was debated for quite a while in Congress um, and was pa finally passed by the Senate in April of 1864. Um, it was not passed at that time by in that uh, spring uh, by the House of Representatives, which would, you know, um, lead Lincoln. Um, uh, he kind of knew what was going to happen, and he had already um, asked Congress to um, to reconsider um, and vote again. And so in uh, at the end of January in 1865, the House voted again and passed the 13th Amendment by a vote of 119 to 56. The significance of the 13th Amendment and even the Emancipation Proclamation is undeniable. The institution of slavery ended, period. Going back, James Madison had said that it would be wrong to admit in the Constitution the idea that there could be such a thing as property in men. And so the Constitutional Convention had not included the word slavery, but it had addressed the problem of slavery and who could be enslaved. In the decades to come, that would lead up to the passage of the 13th Amendment. Anti-slavery Americans and abolitionists, including enslaved people, would argue about whether or not the Constitution included an explicit right, constitutional right to property in slaves or human beings, whether or not Congress was empowered to halt slavery's expansion, putting slavery in Lincoln's words on the course of ultimate extinction. Even Douglas, Frederick Douglass had broken with abolitionist who he said hold the Constitution to be a slaveholding instrument. When he ran for president in 1860, Lincoln had asserted that the founders had operated on purpose to exclude from the Constitution the idea that there could be property in men. And yet, the Constitution provided for counting enslaved people for purposes of taxation and representation and in other ways. All of that changed with the ratification of the 13th Amendment. The Constitution does not require that the president sign amendments, but Lincoln on this amendment added his signature. He signed the joint resolution submitting the 13th Amendment to the states for ratification. And eventually on December 6, 1865, the 13th Amendment was ratified. Of course, Kentucky was among the states that did not and, and would not ratify the 13th Amendment until many years later, later, over 100 years later in 1876. And Mississippi also ratified in the 21st century. When this amendment, the 13th Amendment was submitted to the states for ratification, there were 36 states in the United States including those that had been in rebellion. At least 27 had to ratify for the amendment to come into force. When that happened, there were many who thought that the uh, passage of the 13th Amendment was pernicious, that it was wrong. And of course, among those were, uh, was the man who assassinated the president in April. The immediate effect of the 13th Amendment was to end the system of chattel slavery in the United States. The majority of slaves, we think, had been emancipated by this point, but somewhere between 65 and 100,000 people remained legally enslaved until the passage of the 13th Amendment. 
In addition, the 13th Amendment nullified the Fugitive Slave Clause and the Three-Fifths Compromise. It led broadly to not only political transformations and economic change in the, um, in the country, and in particular in the United States. Following its passage, Congress passed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 that guaranteed citizenship and equal protection of the law to uh, um, African Americans. Um, Congress would go on to authorize the passage of uh, the Freedmen's Bureau Act um, and ultimately enforcement acts uh, to prevent, um, at least hopefully prevent um, the <clears throat> violence that was being enacted against Black people in the aftermath of the Civil War. Congress had refused to admit the delegates that the South sent to Congress when the war ended. If they had been admitted, the country, the Union, would have been restored under a constitution that may have given white Southerners even greater political power than they had before the war. When the war ended and with the passage of the 13th Amendment and the passage of the 14th Amendment and the passage of the 15th Amendment, many people thought, hoped, that not only was slavery over, but also that discrimination against African Americans would no longer be tolerated in this country. Of course, that did not happen. Even though Congress had responded with legislation to enforce the uh, amendments to the Constitution. In 1947, or as late as 1947, the, De the Department of Justice successfully prosecuted a woman for keeping a Black woman in the condition of slavery. The court found that the, that the woman who had been enslaved was a person wholly subject to the will of the defendant, Elizabeth Ingalls, that she was the one who had no freedom of action and whose person and services were wholly under the control of the defendant and who was in a state of enforced compulsory service to the defendant. So long after the amendments had been passed, work remained to be done not only to ensure the freedom of African Americans, to ensure their right to citizenship, and all of the rights that pertain to citizenship in the United States of America. Um, and I think I've had my timer. I think I'll stop there um, and we can take questions. Well, Dr. Dr. Glimpf, you've certainly given us a lot of context and a lot of perspective. Um, We've got several questions, and so let me try to put them um, in a context. First off, um, we could probably stop the screen share, um, and then people would be able to see you better. Okay, uh, okay great. Um, so I want you to know the first person who wrote in said that she wanted uh, to express a a special appreciation for your excellent book, Out of the House of Bondage. Mm -hmm. So you have a fan amongst our amongst our listeners. Um, and we had a couple questions about Lincoln and your perspective on President, you know, President elect and President Lincoln. Um, would you describe him more as a political pragmatist? Um, He's often presented as, you know, the principal leader who led us to the abolition of slavery. How would you balance those two things? Lincoln, President Lincoln was indeed um, a pragmatist. Um, and he was also a constitutionalist. Um, he was a lawyer who... Um, had a view of the Constitution um, that to him suggested that the only way 
to change something like slavery, it would be through a constitutional amendment. And so he, he, I think he made no bones about it. I mean, think Lincoln was a very, um, I think it was he was torn morally, right? I mean, he clearly uh, believed that slavery was morally wrong. So he wasn't torn in that sense, but at the same time, he did not think that he had the power to do anything about it, except through a kind of military decree that he issued with the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, I would say that I think that with a different president, um, certainly had Buchanan still be pre been president, I don't think that we would have even gotten that far. So despite Lincoln's pragmatism, um, I think he also clearly understood as the war went on that, um, that wasn't going, pragmatism wasn't going to be uh, a way or, or uh, a way forward. He understood that black people were taking things into their own hands. He understood that American soldiers, unlike the one he heard about, or the soldiers he heard about who dropped their arms when they heard that black people had been emancipated in Missouri, that increasingly northern black soldiers who encountered black people um, were sympathetic. Um, it doesn't mean that they were all ready to, you might say we're fighting for freedom, but they're increasingly sympathetic uh, to um, the uh, fight for freedom. So I think the emancipation needed both Lincoln and it needed white abolitionists and it needed enslaved people. I think all of these uh, factors were important. So Lincoln's pragmatism ultimately didn't um, uh, stand in the way. I mean, because he knew that if he issued the Emancipation Proclamation, it would just only um, give encouragement, which he wanted to do, to enslave people to leave, to fight back. And so he could have just not done anything. And I think um, uh, with that, his pragmatism sort of took the back seat. And, you know, we've got a lot of people who look at popular media and one of the most popular about the 13th Amendment was Spielberg's Lincoln uh, movie. Would you like to sort of opine about what you think about that movie in terms of historical accuracy? Not too much, but but I will say that I think, I mean, I think one of the main takeaways from that movie was um, the focus on Lincoln, um, coming in at the last moment and working really hard to get passage of the 13th Amendment, right? You know, like sending his uh, people out to like strong arm uh, uh, and get the votes for the passage of the amendment. So that to me, I mean, there in any documentary, um, there will be things that historians like me find irritating or not quite accurate. Um, but I thought as a whole for the general public, um, it did the work it needed to do, which was to show that the, the passage of the 13th, 13th Amendment was not a done deal, um, that it had to be um, um, uh, taken through not only the system, but there was a lot of you know, wrangling about it. There was a lot of arm twisting about it. And maybe some people said even votes uh, uh, purchased, but, but still I, I think um, the movie um, was, uh, um, you know, it, it was a great movie for what it tried to do. And, and that was my main takeaway and it's what I, you know, talk to my students about. And, you know, one of the things I'd love for you to talk about is the whole controversy about the 1619 project, which many praise and many criticize, um, particularly regarding its claim that the Revolutionary War was fought to preserve slavery. Have you got some thoughts about that? Well, I, I don't want to opine on the 1619 Project, um, uh, really. Um, I, I don't agree, I'll say this much. I don't agree that that was the purpose of the Revolutionary War. And I, I think that um, 
there are other places um, in what I've read where I might or would take issue, um, but I have stayed out of that debate um, for lots and of reasons. That's your right, absolutely. Yeah. And so, I, so the main thing is that you know, in terms of the specific uh, question that you asked, I I don't think that that's correct. Um, and one of the questions is about um, Lincoln's relationship with Frederick Douglass. Um, it appeared that they had a respectful relationship and that uh, Mr. Douglas had some influence over President Lincoln's thinking. Is that borne out by historical research? I think it's, it appears from uh, scholars who um, who work, um, you know, like mainly on, on Douglas or scholars who work mainly on Lincoln, like uh, David Blight and Douglas, for example, that um, their relationship developed. I mean, it became uh, uh, more of a relationship where they could trust each other. Um, um, and initially, I don't think that there was that trust there. Um, and so I think it 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 developed and, and Douglas uh, came to respect him and he came to respect um, uh, uh, Douglas. But I would, you know, refer um, people uh, to the wonderful body of work um, by David Blight on the relationship between uh, Douglas and Lincoln. Um, but I, I think that body of work does suggest that it it became um, a more productive, a more productive relationship. Now, you're in a fascinating position as in the law school and a historian. So you look at the law and you look at the history. Um, and in that context, do you think that President Lincoln was really right that he didn't have the authority as president to touch slavery outside of his role as commander in chief? I think he was. I mean, from a constitutional law perspective, um, uh, which is why so many people um, increasingly understood that it would take a constitutional amendment. Um, and I think in the letter that Lincoln um, wrote in 61 in, in response to uh, General Fremont's proclamation, you know, um, there he spells out so carefully why he believed he could not act. And, and he also made it clear that if he could, he would, right? But he couldn't, he believed, um, um, by law. Now, um, yeah, so I, I don't, yeah, I think, I think we had to have, I mean, the, there's no constitutional provision. Um, there was not one that said slavery is legal. I mean, this is all state law, right? Um, mm -hmm. But to end it from a federal uh, 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 perspective on federal grounds, I, I do think the amendment was required. And, you know, let's have a little bit of conversation about the role of the Congress in this whole situation. Uh, you know, Congressman Thaddeus Stevens and Senator Charles Sumner were certainly advocates, uh, persuasive advocates uh, on behalf of uh, the abolition of slavery. And what kind of role did they play in their en engagement with President Lincoln? I mean, I think um, Republicans like them, especially the leading Republicans like Betty Stevens, were constantly sounding, um, you know, the, the drums that, that um, this country um, cannot go on as a slave nation, um, that we could not um, continue to think that slavery was a, a problem of the South or could be limited to 
um, southern states and maybe uh, in the future some other states that might join and become slave states, but that it was a national problem that had to be confronted, not only on the moral level, but also because we're talking about human beings uh, in general. So I, I, I think Lincoln was, I mean, he's been um, sort of pounded from all kinds of, uh, of, of perspectives. I mean, he's been pounded from the military, you know, like people want victory. They want a military victory and they want it sooner than later. So he's got his um, hands full just dealing with his generals and making sure, or trying to make sure that we win the darn thing from a military perspective. He's got his hands full with enslaved people who are saying, like, you know, like we're we're part of this. And he's got his hands full from uh, 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 politicians or leading congressmen who are saying we can do more, we can do it faster. And I think, you know, I mean, there's clearly some irritation on his part um, initially um, and maybe throughout, but but he 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 does understand where they're coming from, even if he doesn't necessarily always appreciate um, the particular language or the fact that they seem to be sometimes uh, coming after him. Uh, so I, I, there's no question that he heard them. Um, and there's also little question that he was often irritated, but I don't know if that irritation was the result of not agreeing with them so much as it was his just feeling overwhelmed by everything that he had on his plate, you know, and, 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 um, to include, of course, his own um, uh, concerns for his, um, his family um, during this time. And as we look at this, the 13th Amendment was sort of first up. Um, followed by the 14th and 15th, which we will be talking about, you know, in later series. So we're not expecting you to opine at, in great length on those. But do you have a short thought about who, who really pushed to get the 14th and 15th amendments uh, moved forward? And what was the, what was the hole that people saw after the passage of the 13th Amendment? I mean, I think we have some of the same actors um, pushing for uh, the 14th and 15th Amendment. And, and, and we have also the growing recognition that left to their own devices, um, a white Southerners would ignore, not ignore, but they would not accept um, uh, Black people as full citizens uh, with equal rights. And they, they demonstrated um, this um, already through the passage of the so-called Black Codes. They had demonstrated it by voting themselves back to Congress. Um, and then they demonstrated it by, you know, like appealing to President Johnson and saying like, okay, we're reconstructed and we're, we're going to be good guys and um, just give us our, our, our rights back. And Johnson said, okay. Um, and so they came back and they didn't change in terms of their desire to have at their beck and call, um, a class of people who would do um, the work of, of a culture of plantation labor at very little cost to the plantation owners themselves and at great cost to uh, the formerly enslaved people. Um, so there were um, clearly, um, there was evidence coming uh, into uh, Washington and, and, and the congressmen were increasingly aware of that um, this, this 13th Amendment was not enough. Um, the violence um, was just extreme, the Klan. And so Congress um, also considering, you know, which um, we, we also talk about, of course, also considered the fact that um, for the Republicans to retain um, power, uh, they it would be very useful to have um, the black vote, no longer counting as three fifths of a vote, but each person having a full vote. Um, and so there was also um, a, a, a desire to um, ensure that black men got the vote. And black men themselves have been saying um, uh, since before the war, um, and certainly during the war when they were serving as soldiers, like we should have the right to vote. 
Um, and so I think it's a combination of factors that pushed Congress to enact the 14th Amendment um, for citizenship and then the 15th Amendment um, uh, uh, given black men the right to vote over the objection, um, of course, also uh, of some women um, at that time. And do you have any thoughts about why didn't the United States have the resolve to see reconstruction all the way through to its promise? You think it would have been different if Lincoln had survived? I don't know. I'm not sure it would have been different, I think. There was never complete um, or anything close to 100% embrace of Black freedom uh, among white Americans, right? Um, and so it, was, it always felt a little conditional, a little impermanent. And when the war ended, there was a, a desire on the part of many white Northerners to get back to work. And by that, they meant get back to the work of growing businesses, of thinking about, you know, our nation's foreign policy of thinking about um, how we dealt with the West and indigenous people. Um, so the, 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 the intense focus that had been on enslaved people and on um, emancipated people uh, didn't last. It, 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 it just didn't last. And maybe because there was no, um, ultimately no, sort of mass you know, or concern on the, on the part of the mass of majority of people uh, for this. And it was also some who assumed that, okay, we've done our part. Now it's up to them. You know, they're free, they have citizenship, they have the right to vote. So um, if they can't pull themselves up by the bootstraps, that's sort of their problem, which was to ignore the violence, which was to ignore the this, the court decisions um, that would lead up to uh, Plessy um, and the continuing um, assaults on, on, on Black communities. So we can't um, um, point our fingers at any one thing, but the combination of things for, that were uh, important to white Northerners, um, they were more important than Black freedom. I would say. And, you know, we're, we're coming to the close of our, uh, our traditional uh, time. And this is an audience that loves history and loves to read. Yeah. And, you know, they've, they've gotten information about your book. But one of the questions that one of our people asked is, we're going to have two last questions. So I want you to start thinking about the last one. The last one we're going to ask you is, what would you encourage people to read if they were going to just read a few books about the Civil War? But before we answer that question, you talked about the 13th Amendment and that Kentucky and Mississippi finally ratified the 13th Amendment in 1976 for Kentucky and 1995 for Mississippi. What was going on that brought those to the fore at that particular moment? Um, well, it wasn't until um, mid 1970s um, that in Kentucky, three uh, members, uh, Black members of the Kentucky legislature uh, filed a resolution to finally ratify the 13th Amendment. Um, I think in the interim years, um, and especially before there were black congressmen, uh, it just wasn't um, an issue. And, and I think you know people have forgotten also that it never been ratified. I think people had also forgotten in Mississippi that it never had never been ratified. Um, uh, and so I think having 
both the civil rights movement and having black people in the legislature and people start thinking about and you know and conversations about freedom and about emancipation about the civil war increasingly conversations about um the role of uh, black people in the civil war had more people thinking about these matters and i don't know who um uh, discovered uh uh, quote unquote, that this had not been done particularly, but I'm sure that's in the record somewhere. Um, uh, uh, but I do know that um, at least in Kentucky, um, uh, there were three black uh, legislators who, who filed the resolution for adoption. And there was no, I mean, uh, uh, the vote was unanimous. Um, well, thank goodness. <laughs> I mean, well, you never know. <laughs> I know. I was really going to worry. Now, okay. So, if you were going to give people just a handful of books uh, that would be must reads about the Civil War, what would they be? And would it include Carl Sandburg's six volume biography of Lincoln? Oh, so, I'm not going to have my friends um, angry at me about not naming their books. Uh, <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Um, um, you know, people uh, like multi-volume works that uh, used to be published, like Carl Sandburg's. Um, I think they're for aficionados, but you know, not for necessarily the general public. I think um, um, I would, you know, send people to um, Blight, to Foner, to for military history, to people like Gary Gallagher who. Um, you know, um, has read all of those multi-volume collections. Um, um, Harold Holzer, I would, you know, include in a group of people, you know, um, writing about um, the war and Lincoln. Um, there are just so many, and I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to, um, um, I can I can uh, send you a list later, but because I I'm afraid I'm going to not name someone and don't and, don't worry about it. It's yeah, not a pop quiz, and <laughs> yeah. um, we do we do send everybody uh, a link to this 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 um, important webinar is recorded, so people can come back and take a look at it. And when we send it to them, we'll send them uh, information about your book and. You know, if anybody has additional thoughts, you can share them with us. We we email on a regular basis. We thank you, uh, Savolia. Thank Thanks. you for making the time. And we really appreciate your being with us and being so generous with your, your, your scholarship and your wisdom. Uh, it is a joy to be with you. And to all of our uh, listeners, uh, thank you very much. We remind you, this is always what we call our NPR moment. Uh, these are only available because of the support from the members and donors to the United States Capitol Historical Society. So we thank you for that. Um, and one of the best ways that you can uh, support us is to share the information with your friends and neighbors and encourage them to become members. Um, we hope you'll all become members and supporters. Thank you. Thank you, Thavolia. We're Thank honored you. to have you with us. Um, <laughs> and we wish you all a pleasant spring without too much pollen. Take care. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much. All right. Be well. Goodbye. Be well.